We have a warning tonight from an East Dallas couple about their run-in with Child Protective Services. A mother noticed a bruise on her infant daughter and took her then to the doctor. And what followed is a horror story the parents believe could happen to anyone. Lori Brown is here now with a story you will see only on Fox 4. As the parent of two young children myself, this story is alarming. The Grant family showed their daughter's injury to her pediatrician. CPS began an investigation and sent a letter that initially ruled out physical abuse. But a month later, according to court documents, CPS could not determine who caused the injury. And that prompted the agency to take the Grant's two children while they were at work. <laughs> it was the hardest thing that I've ever dealt with. The Grants were a happy family, loving life with their sweet, then five-month-old Zoe and rambunctious 23-month-old Wyatt. Oh, man. Jason and I have had to bury one of our children already. Um, my son Wyatt is an identical twin, and we lost his brother very far into the pregnancy, late in the third term. We've already buried one of our children, and as hard as that was to go through, it was so much harder to have my living children ripped from me. Oh, good pass! This all began February 28th, three days after Lindsey Grant went back to work after her maternity leave. Lindsay picked up Zoe and Wyatt from their daycare, which their son had attended for nearly two years. She says she noticed discoloration on Zoe's bottom when she was giving her a bath. She took Zoe to her pediatrician, who determined that the mark was a bruise and it looked like a handprint. He made a mandatory referral to the Department of Family Protective Services, and the grants took their children out of that daycare. Child Protective Services began an investigation speaking to both the daycare and the grants. And then this was the next time I heard from her. On April 16th, CPS sent a letter to the grants. That showed that we were ruled out for physical abuse. CPS's letter actually only says physical abuse was ruled out. The grants were relieved. They felt they'd been cleared. We're going to go take a nap. On April 18th, CPS came back, go requesting that they take Zoe for an exam at a yeah. clinic the state chose. That clinic's report concluded that Zoe had no injuries at that time, but that her mother's own photos of the bruise did appear to match that of an object like a hand. But the clinic made no determination about who was responsible for the abuse. May 2nd, the Texas Department of Family Protective Services sent a letter to the daycare citing insufficient evidence to substantiate a finding of physical abuse. Ashley McDowell is the grant's attorney. The daycare did have cameras, um, and when I spoke to the daycare worker, the daycare manager or owner, she said that they only kept the tapes for a period of time. So I think their backup lasted 10 days, and so the tapes were gone. Weeks after the clinic's exam and 78 days after CPS first began their investigation, the grants received a call. It came at 4.50 p.m. Friday, Memorial Day weekend. And that's when she said, no, I don't think you understand. We have your kids. And that's when the alarm hit off. CPS had taken their children from the new daycare while the grants were both at work. An affidavit from CPS says the parents and daycare's timelines about the injury were contradictory. And daycare staff stated they were the ones that first addressed the bruising. I didn't know if I was going to be able to walk to my car. I was weak in my knees. The Grants hired an attorney, but a judge would not hear their motion for an emergency hearing. The judge basically dismissed us and said, we'll see you at the 14-day hearing. The Grants were able to visit their children two times at a CPS office, each time having to say goodbye to the children who did not understand why their parents had to leave them. The second time, he kind of went down. crazy and he actually got the door back open and we had i had to go out and put him back out there you're handing your children back to people that you don't trust that you don't trust at all the same affidavit says cps's case to remove the children consisted of this no one is able to provide an explanation as to how the injuries occurred and medical examinations revealed that the injuries were inflicted and zoe could not do them to herself Mr. and Mrs. Grant's explanations regarding the injuries are inconsistent, and there were no other caregivers responsible for the care of the child other than the daycare. We took the case to someone who knows this process from every angle, former Judge Angie Bain, who began her career as a CPS caseworker. They made the decision to remove these kids 
frankly, without much basis. Uh, Bain is now a family law attorney and is not involved in the Grant's case. Well, I've reviewed all the paperwork that's been provided to me, and I think all the paperwork that probably exists. And it would appear to me that CPS really dropped the ball somewhere toward the end of the investigation period. A judge signed off on CPS's request to seize the Grant's children. Does the court sometimes just rubber stamp these cases? I'd like to say no, but I think that it is true that sometimes um, not enough attention is given. Is this concerning to you? Yes, it is. And, and why is that? Because we do terrific harm when we, when we remove a child from their parents. Even if it's temporary, it's still, it's really damaging to the kids. And of course it's damaging to the parents, and so that decision has to be made with great thought and great study. We need to protect kids. We need to err on the side of caution. These are the text messages. That the grants contacted every lawmaker they could to help get their children back. State Senator Brian Hughes from Mineola in East Texas answered. He told us in a statement that he met with CPS administrators and he is very concerned about how the case was handled. Can I hold you? <laughs> the grants were reunited after 11 days, three days sooner than their scheduled court hearing. But they say the damage was already done. She was fine. Yeah, she was fine. But Wyatt was in disarray. It was stress that he was missing patches of hair. And for the first week, the toddler had trouble sleeping. He'd wake up every hour of the night yelling, screaming. He was upset. And like I said, sometimes I could calm him down, but sometimes I'd have to kick on the light and be like, it's daddy, I'm here, you're okay. Judge Bain hopes lessons will be learned in this case, and not only at CPS. She thinks the DA's office and the judge in this case may have approved the removal of the children too quickly. I think this is a, an example and a reminder that everybody should slow down and take the time that's needed to make the appropriate decisions. The grants say they are sharing their story for one reason. We're speaking out because someone has got to hold this organization accountable. Like the ball was definitely dropped and there's no way that we're the only family that this was done to. So how does Child Protective Services explain this mess? Six weeks after the grants received their children back, CPS sent a letter that confirmed its finding that abuse occurred, but stated their investigation was unable to determine who was responsible for the abuse. Their findings are consistent with the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, which also investigated the daycare and also determined that there was insufficient evidence to determine abuse. CPS declined an on-camera interview about the situation, saying they can't talk about it because of state law. The judge is not answering even general questions about the 14-day hearing process. And after days of trying, we've received no response from the Dallas District Attorney's Office. We're waiting.